Welcome to our second lecture covering chapter 12 of our textbook. This chapter is called The Reality of Ascent. When we were last together, we uh, discussed um, two of the five obstacles to ascent that um, uh, can affect the formation of an agreement. We talked about mistake, both mutual and unilateral mistake, and we talked about misrepresentation. Uh, particularly three types, innocent, negligent, and fraudulent misrepresentation. In the second lecture, we're going to dive into undue influence, duress, and unconscionability. But before we do that, let's backtrack and think about where we are overall in the structure of contract law. We know that there are four elements to a contract, agreement, consideration, capacity, and legal object. We know that agreement is an element of a contract, but that there are two elements to agreement. One is offer and one is acceptance. We talked about the ideas uh, about agreement in chapter nine. We talked about the elements of consideration in chapter 10, and we talked about both capacity and legal object in chapter 11. In chapter 12, the chapter that we're on right now, is we're gonna reopen the topic that we talked about in chapter nine and dig a little deeper into the idea of acceptance. When we were in chapter nine, we talked about what an offer is and what an acceptance is. We talked about the mirror image rule and about how they have to mirror each other. But even when they appear to mirror each other, there can still be problems. And so that's what the focus of this particular chapter is. And as we talked about, we have these five obstacles to ascent. Um, so let's go just, actually, let's go for a second and look at our um, kind of uh, uh, outline of, of, um, of uh, contract law. We, we are focusing in chapter 12, um, we're talking about the idea of acceptance. Let's see how our outline looks differently once we add the chapter 12 materials. And you can see what's happened is we've added this stuff right here. I'll put it in uh, pink highlight so it can be easy to see. Um, we said that initially that there were three elements for an offer and that there are three elements for an acceptance. And we talked about how this element, put this in yellow, mirrors up with this element of acceptance. This element of offer marries up with this element of acceptance. And we talked about how the final level of offer marries up with this level of acceptance. But we can see how um, when you think about acceptance, you can also see impediments to acceptance. Now, some people who look at uh, contract law would have this category, everything in pink, as a third element of agreement. They would have offer, acceptance, and reality of assent. Some people put reality of assent under acceptance. Um, I think this is more true to the way our textbook is organized, so I've put it under here. But if it helps you to understand it, to put it over here, more power to you. I'm just not gonna do that in this class. So anyway, that's, this is what we're adding here. We've covered mistake and we've covered misrepresentation. So let's dive back into our PowerPoint and we're going to Go ahead and start on undue influence. What is undue influence? Well, an undue influence, you have two parties, and they are, in fact, the two parties to the contract, usually. So we have party A. The Party A is the dominant party. Um, in this case, it would be the caregiver, this, um, this lady here, um, who has a position of trust with respect to this other senior citizen here. So this is A, and this in our story is going to be B. Now A can be a variety of different people. It doesn't have to be a caregiver. It could be an attorney, it could be a doctor, a guardian, a relative, lots of different relationships. And B would not have to be an elderly person, but uh, People who are in um, vulnerable positions are usually the folks that we think about as being potentially the victims of undue influence. And that would include the elderly, also the very young, the unsophisticated, uh, perhaps people with disabilities, 
um, physical disabilities, but also potentially intellectual disabilities or people experiencing mental health issues. Usually people who are in some sense um, having a struggle in their life. It might also be somebody who um, is ill or who has um, uh, experienced some financial reversals or who ha or is going through a grief or some circumstance like that. So lots of different circumstances can put someone in a vulnerable position like B. But when we have someone in a vulnerable position and we're thinking undue influence may be an issue, then we have to look at A. And how does A um, uh, have this dominant position with respect to B? Once we find that dominant position, we have A and B identified, it doesn't mean that just because they enter into a contract together that it follows that any contract they enter into is somehow null and void. Um, that's this relationship is just one factor that is examined to see if undue influence might be relevant. Let's look at the definitions uh, to kind of go through and see when undue influence might be present. Undue influence occurs when A, this person right here, has taken advantage of his or her dominant position in a relationship to unduly in, uh, persuade B, this person down here to the extent that A, this person's persuasive efforts have interfered with B, this person's ability to make his or her own decision. So A, the dominant person, is um, unduly working to persuade B and, and interfering B's ability to make an independent decision. Usually there's going to be some unusual pressures that are unique to that uh, arrangement that has caused the undue influence argument to arise. But let's look at this in a more practical standpoint. What do we mean when we talk about undue influence? Well, um, it might be a situation, let's think as we're, we're looking at this, this uh, we'll, we'll call this nurse and we'll call this senior. So nurse is the person who cares for senior on a day in day out basis. Nurse has been hired by senior or maybe by senior's family to care for senior's needs. Senior is not in, in good health. Um, if someone isn't there to care for senior, senior may um, not have sufficient food to eat, may not be clothed, may need uh, assistance with bathing and bathroom issues, um, may have some a level of forgetfulness or uh, confusion, may not know when uh, to take medication, may not be able to administer some of the medication. And so nurse is really essential to senior's life. So if nurse were to say, hey, um, senior, um, your, your son or your daughter is paying me uh, $10 an hour to care for you, uh, but if you wanna have dinner tonight, you need to pay me 20 more dollars. Um, well, that would be a situation in which the nurse is using her undue influence to persuade senior to do something. Obviously, senior wants to have dinner, um, and so she uh, feels that she doesn't have a lot of choices under those circumstances. Um, when, um, of course, in this situation, we'd have another issue. We would have a pre-existing duty because the nurse has the obligation to as part of her job responsibility to feed the senior. So we'd also have that issue. But let's imagine that um, the nurse has been senior's nurse for uh, three years and is senior's main source of interaction with other people. Senior and the nurse have gotten to be very close. Uh, senior trusts the nurse. The nurse has been very careful and competent um, and kind in caring for senior. Um, senior has come to think very highly of nurse under these circumstances. Well, throughout these three years, nurse has uh, kind of behind the scenes been uh, being so nice and supportive so that they could develop this relationship so that she could um, now manipulate senior to do something that is not in senior's best interest. So nurse says, hey nurse, um, I'm starting my own business, but I need some capital to get the business started would you be willing to help? It's gonna make you a ton of money, it's gonna be awesome, and it would also benefit me. 
Well, let's say the nurse, the senior says, well, you know, let me think about it. I'll, I'd like to talk about it with my son and my daughter and my accountant and my attorney, uh, but I certainly will give it some careful thought. Nurse says, oh, you have to decide today. Um, I need to get the money so that I can sign the lease, and today is the very last day I can do it. Well, under those circumstances, we've satisfied the first element of the undue influence uh, questions that we ask ourselves. Is the dominant party, the nurse in this case, rushing the other party into the situation? We probably have the other situation, the, the second element, which is, is the dominant party, is, is he or she going to gain undue enrichment from the agreement? Let's say the agreement provides that the, the senior, who is a wealthy woman, um, is going to pay the nurse $100,000, but the nurse only has to give the senior a 5% interest in the business. Um, it's very unlikely, given the nature of the business, that it will ever earn uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and so it's very unlikely that the senior will ever be able to uh, make back the amount of money that, uh, the, the, uh, given what she's paying in. So that would be another indication. It doesn't look like a, a long, uh, links, um, a long, uh, arm's length agreement. Was the non-dominant person, in our case senior, isolated from other advisors? Well, yes, the nurse approaches senior when they're alone. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But because she rushes senior to making a decision, senior doesn't have the ability to contact other folks. So we have this also being satisfied in these circumstances. And we also have that the exchange overwhelmingly benefits the dominant party. So in this case, that contract we have all four of these elements. Now, it's not necessary that you have all four. You might only have one, but that one is really dominant. That could be enough. Or you could have all four at least to some degree, but uh, maybe the this is instead of being a senior citizen who is elderly and forgetful, this is instead an, an able-bodied, independent 40-year-old. Uh, um, so maybe that person really isn't in a um, non-dominant position. And so the court might find, even though these, these features are present, undue influence really isn't in play under these circumstances. So it's really a judgment call for the court to make. But these are some things that are being considered. Now you can see for undue influence, we don't have to prove fraud. We don't have to prove that the nurse has lied about any facts or even misrepresented or even accidentally misrepresented facts. So for an undue influence argument, or, uh, or you, you, it could be that the nurse has been completely truthful to uh, the senior. Maybe she hasn't, but it's not necessary that she be untruthful in order to be successful in an undue influence claim. Okay, so we've covered undue influence. Now we're going to go on and talk about duress. Duress is probably the most straightforward of these situations. Um, the picture here kind of shows you the idea behind it. If you and I, let's say I, I have a, a, a dry erase marker, and I uh, say, hey, look at this dry erase marker, Bob. And Bob looks at it and says, oh, yeah, it looks like a nice dry erase marker. I say, it's brand new. Um, would you be willing to pay me $50 for it? Bob says, well, well, no, I don't need a dry erase marker. And even if I did, um, I can buy one of these for less than a dollar. And so, no, I, I wouldn't pay you $50 for this dry erase marker. And then I pull out my knife or my gun and I say, okay, um, now, have you thought about it a little bit more carefully? And I'm pointing the gun at, at Bob's head, and Bob says, why, yes, I have thought about it more, and I think that $50 for this dry erase marker is a good deal, and I would love to buy this marker. And so Bob reaches into his uh, back pocket, pulls out his wallet, and gives me $50. I say, thank you, Bob, for the $50. Here is your dry erase marker. I hope you enjoy it. And we part company. Well, let's assume that whole conversation between Bob and I had been tape recorded. Other than the quivering of his voice, uh, there would be no telltale indications that um, I had done anything wrong. It just looked like, weirdly, Bob wanted to spend a lot of money on a dry erase marker. Um, uh, obviously, that wouldn't have to play out. It could be that Bob might have said, You're, you have a gun to my head. And I go, well, what do you think about the deal now? But you can see, into those circumstances, Bob really didn't have free will. 
if he wanted to continue living, he needed to agree to the terms. And he considered, well, $50 is a pretty good deal to save one's life. Of course, under those circumstances, even though Bob said the words that indicate acceptance, he truly wasn't accepting the deal. He was only doing it because he was being forced to do so. And so that would be a circumstance in which we do not have um, true acceptance. We don't have a true agreement. Now, the gun to the head is not only duress from a contract perspective, but it's also a crime, obviously. But many times duress situations aren't that extreme. It could be that um, I threatened to breach a contract. Listen, Bob, if you don't buy this marker from me for $50, I'm not going to finish painting your barn, even though you're supposed to be having a big party there this weekend, and it would be embarrassing if it were not completed. That's not a crime for me to do that, um, but it certainly would be very inconvenient for Bob, and Bob might say to himself, look, if she'll finish the, the job, I'm willing to pay $50 not to be embarrassed when I throw my party, and it looks terrible. And so under those circumstances, Bob might agree to pay the $50, but then he might sue me under a duress theory saying, the only reason why I agreed to that deal was because um, you threatened to breach a contract. You made a threat. And it was an unlawful act for you to threaten to breach, even though it was not a criminal act. Now, there can be times where you make a threat that is not unlawful, that... Um, uh, a person can can feel that they are under duress. So let me Matt, present a different scenario. This time I have that marker and I say to Bob, Bob, um, uh, are you willing to pay $50 for this dry erase marker? And Bob says, well, I know I'm not. And then I say, well, Bob, you know you breached on that contract with me. You were supposed to finish painting my barn. You never did so. Um, that caused me to have significant losses because um, I was unable to sell that barn um, when I wanted to sell it. And so it caused me some, some genuine financial distress. And Bob says, yeah, I know, I did breach the contract. Um, and I say, well, you know, I've never sued you about that. And I could sue you about that still. The statutory period hasn't expired. And so if you don't buy this dry erase marker for $50, I am going to sue you. Well, Bob thinks, well, gosh, I don't want to get sued. If I get sued, it's going to cost me a lot more than $50. So I think that I will go ahead and buy this marker for $50. This would not be a situation of duress because my threat is completely lawful. I'm not threatening to make up some kind of allegation that isn't true or to advance some right that I don't genuinely have. I genuinely have a colorable claim against Bob. And so my threat to do that is not an unlawful threat. It's a lawful threat, and therefore, it's not a duress situation. Now, sometimes people confuse duress with undue influence. In a duress situation, you don't have to actually have that dominant and non-dominant relationship. In fact, the two people who are entering the contract may not even know each other. So that's one difference between duress and undue influence. The second is that the the level of action that is interfering with the free will is usually quite a bit more uh, dramatic, more obvious. In undue influence situations, much, much more often it's a subtle situation. They both, though, have to do with the free will. So if you want to compare duress with undue influence, this doesn't require any unusual or special relationship, and it's usually going to be much more visible uh, than undue influence. So we've considered now four of our five obstacles to genuine assent. Mistake, misrepresentation, undue influence, and duress. We now are gonna talk about unconscionability. We've already talked about this topic though at, at a fair amount of, of uh, level of specificity in um, our, I believe it was our last chapter, yes, it was our last chapter, chapter 11 in the legality section, and we talked about how unconscionable contracts violate public policy. So this is largely a repeat. You can see the issue of unconscionability as affecting the acceptance. Um, in other words, uh, the, the, the part of the, the, the element that has to do with agreement, 
or you can see it as affecting the legality of the contract. Either way is a legitimate uh, model to think about it. So let's look at our definition. Unconscionable is a contract or bargain which is so unfair to a party that no reasonable person would agree to it. It usually arises when one party has a lot more bargaining power than the other party. And this is, again, a grounds for rescinding the contract if the court agrees that it was truly, truly unconscionable. Remember, as always, though, the courts are loath to do so. They do not want to play nanny. After all, we're talking about adults here. This, in order for it to be contracted at all, the person involved has to have had legal capacity. We also, in, in the last chapter, talked about adhesion contracts, which are take-it-or-leave-it contracts. Just because a contract is an adhesion contract does not mean that it is um, unconscionable. It's just one factor that the court's going to look at. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that the court will ultimately find that an adhesion contract is unconscionable. In fact, most likely the court won't find uh, an adhesion contract is unconscionable because most of the time whomever made the adhesion contract was very very careful they knew of that possibility and they really thought about it pretty long and hard to make sure that it would uh, successfully pass that jurisdiction's unconscionability uh, expectations <coughs> excuse me so now we've gone through all five of our <coughs> obstacles to genuine assent Mistake, misrepresentation, undue influence, duress, and unconscionability. If you have any questions about this topic, uh, as always, please come to my office hours, send me an email, or raise those issues in class. Before we leave, I just want to do one little refresher and show you, <coughs> excuse me, I guess the, the master, the whole elements of contract law. So this is kind of our final go through of the elements. There are four elements to contract law. We need to have an agreement, we need, which is of course covered mainly in chapter nine. We need to have consideration, which is covered in chapter 10. We need to have contractual capacity, which is covered in chapter 12, I'm sorry, chapter 11. And we need to have legal object, which is covered in the second half of chapter 11. When we're talking about agreement, Agreement has two sub-elements. It has to have an offer and acceptance. There are three sub-sub-elements to an offer. Um, the offeror must ma manifest an intent to be bound by the offeree's acceptance. Um, the offeror or, uh, must make the terms of the offer definite and certain, and specifically the material terms of that offer definite and certain. And of course, the offeror must communicate the offer to the offeree. That's what we need in order to have an offer. But an offer by itself is not good enough to create an agreement. In addition to an offer, we have to have another element, agreement. And in order to have an agreement, I'm assuming acceptance, we, in order to have an acceptance, we have to have, just like we have to have the offeror intend to be bound, we have to have the offeree intend to be bound. A manifestation of intent to be bound by the acceptance. And we have to have the acceptance be to those specific and certain terms of the offer that we talked about up here. And finally, the offeree has to communicate his acceptance to the offeror. Again, it's the parallel obligation that we talked about here. In chapter 12, we went on and talked about the potential obstacles to uh, true assent in these circumstances. Even when all of these things are present, there's pot, and it looks like we have a true offer and acceptance, and therefore we have a true agreement. These elements, the ones we cover in chapter 12, can, can uh, cause that not to be the case. And we talked about mistake, both unilateral and mutual. We talked about misrepresentation, which is um, uh, the misstatement of fact. And we talked about when it can be innocent, uh, negligent, or fraudulent. We talked about undue influence, where somebody in a dominant position uh, uh, by the force of, of that relationship uh, takes away essentially the free will of the person who's non-dominant. We talked about duress, which doesn't require a, per, a uh, special relationship, but also involves the taking of the free will and so therefore making true acceptance not really possible. And then we talked about unconscionability. That's our first element of contract law, the, the necessary elements for agreement. Then we talked about consideration in chapter 10 and we went through the nine rules of consideration. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I will flag this first one, which is kind of a definition. 
of consideration. Consideration is what a person will receive in return for performing a contractual obligation. Then we went on and talked about contractual capacity. We talked about people who are minors, in other words, people under the age of 18 lack contra contractual capacity. We also talked about incompetent people, people, for example, who though they're over the age of 18 because of an intellectual limitation or a mental health limitation um, are deemed not to have the capacity to enter into contracts. Um, contracts with minors are usually considered voidable. Contracts with incompetent people usually are considered voidable, but if that person has been adjudicated as incompetent, the contract may be considered void. And then we talked about when, an into when a severely or significantly intoxicated person enters into a contract, that contract may also be um, uh, void. Uh, I'm assuming not void, voidable. And again, we're talking about intoxication due to alcohol, or they could be properly prescribed medication, or they can be illegal substances. In all these cases, we talked about necessaries and the fact that people sometimes do need, even people who have these limitations, they still need a roof over their head and food in their stomachs. And so those contracts are going to be honored at least to, to the degree in which a reasonable amount of money was, was spent on those items. <clears throat> Finally, our last of our four elements of contract law is legal object. Um, we talked about the fact that in order to have an enforceable contract, the contract must have both a must have a legal exchange as its subject, and it must be able to be performed legally. Then we um, became more specific about the legal object as a subject. So we talked about the fact that the legal object cannot violate state or federal statutes. Um, and we also talked about the fact that it cannot violate public policy. The state or federal statutes that we focused on, and this is not an exhaustive list, would be contracts for crimes. Again, that's going to be a void contract. Contracts for toys, ter <laughs> torts, that's also going to be a void contract. Contracts with non-licensed persons, this can vary. It depends upon the, the policy reason to require a license of these professionals. So this can be a contract that is enforceable by the other person, the person who is not the, the non-licensed professional, or sometimes it can be even enforceable by the non-licensed professional, especially if the license was really focused on uh, raising revenue for the state. We also talked about the usurious contract situation, how state laws will provide a maximum um, interest rate on certain loans and transactions, and how if the interest rate on a particular uh, co a contract exceeds that amount, then the courts are going to um, not honor that contract as it's written. We also talked about uh, gambling laws and Sabbath, which are also called blue laws, and complying with those laws. So those are our uh, aspects that we focused on this class uh, when a contract might uh, violate a state or federal statute. Now let's talk about the public policy circumstance. The agreement, of course, must not violate a public policy. We talked about contracts in restrictive trade, especially covenants or contracts not to compete, such as an employment context or when a person sells an ongoing business. In Texas, we actually have a, sta a statute in this area, um, but not all states do have that, and so they oftentimes look to case law and public policy to kind of figure out what the standard is in their particular state. This is an area where there's a lot of different, differing opinions from state to state. And so as you move around the country and interact in different parts of the country, it, don't assume that the things I told you about Texas law would necessarily apply in a different jurisdiction. Finally, we talked about unconscionable contracts. And again, we talked about unconscionable contracts both down here in Chapter 11 and also up here in Chapter 12. It's pretty much the same presentation, so you're getting uh, it twice. You can see unconscionable contracts can be problematic because they don't have a legal object, and they can be problematic because they indicate that there was not a real acceptance which means there wasn't a real agreement. So either way, an unconscionable contract, if it's truly unconscionable, is not going to create a contract. Um, this category of unconscionable contracts would include some exculpatory clauses in otherwise enforceable contracts. Keep in mind, though, that courts are reluctant to find a contract to be unconscionable. The court doesn't want to step in and um, take away people's right to contract, to act as a nanny. That's not usually their role. So it has to be a pretty extreme circumstance for the court to step in in this way. <clears throat>
At this point, we've covered um, all that we're going to cover about the elements of contract law. We will, in, in a, a, a future chapter, discuss the sometimes fifth requirement of contract law, which is that sometimes a writing is required. But I'm not including, including it on this particular format because that is not usually a requirement for contract law. And we're really just focusing on the things you have to have to have. So I hope that this uh, presentation has been useful. Again, if you have questions or concerns or uh, you want to talk about these ideas in more detail, don't be shy. Send me an email, stop by my office hours, or raise those during class. Um, I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day.